Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today with another read aloud as we are getting close to the end of The Vander Beakers of 141st Street, written by Karina Jan Glaser and published by Hot and Mifflin Harcourt. We're gonna pick up where we left off with chapter 20 on uh, the end, uh, nearing the end of Christmas Eve. Isa and Jesse changed silently in their bedroom and tossed their food-splattered clothes into the laundry hamper. Outside, the wind swooshed and whistled. Isa left the room with her violin in hand, and Jesse found herself alone with her thoughts. Isa's angry words from the previous day kept running through her head. Do you have the right to make decisions for me? We're not the same. Jesse recalled the tears running down her sister's face at the idea of Benny taking another girl to the dance. Did Isa really like Benny? What if Issa and Benny didn't reconcile before they moved? Jessie looked around the bedroom. She thought about all the nights that they had stayed up late, talking in whispers and using their pillows to muffle their laughter. Jessie saw Issa's perfectly made bed and her own bed with its twisted sheets and rumpled blankets. In the corner of the room by the big window, there was a loose floorboard that the twins had pried up five years earlier when they were convinced that a treasure was hidden underneath. Now they used the space to stash Halloween candy before Mama confiscated it. Jessie took a deep breath. She couldn't fix the Biederman problem. She couldn't fix the moving problem. But she could try to fix the Benny problem. Mr. Van Houten, his violin case slung over his shoulder, blew into the brownstone right before dinner began, exclaiming over the severe weather. He whipped off his hat, revealing a head of unruly hair. He greeted the adults hugged the kids, and kissed Franz right on the lips. After numerous runs up and down the stairs to retrieve food and flatware and dishes, the table was finally set. Auntie Harrigan added her own contributions to the table. A glazed ham and a flourless chocolate cake. Miss Josie set out a pot of collard greens and southern cornbread. Gloom hung heavy over the dining table as the kids sat themselves down for their final Christmas Eve dinner in the brownstone. Papa said the blessings and thanked everyone for coming. After a round of applause to the cooks, the twins looking like they were being sentenced to a year's worth of dishwashing, everyone dug in. Oliver made a point to avoid the beef stew when it was offered to him. He surreptitiously observed everyone as they scooped large ladlefuls into their bowls. When no one spit it out, Oliver reached across the table to ladle a small amount of the stew into his bowl and then took a tentative sip. But wait, it tasted normal. What happened to all the salt? Auntie Harrigan nudged his arm and winked. It's amazing what a little extra water and broth can do, she whispered. Ah, Oliver said. He looked up the um, uh, at, uh, he looked up at Uncle Arthur, who saluted Oliver with a soup spoon. I guess this will bump up their edible meal percentage. Auntie Harrigan shrugged. I do what I gotta do, she responded. A more morose Christmas Eve dinner had never been had amongst the Vanderbeekers. Every window rattled ominously against the wind, which increased in severity throughout the meal. The kids, the adults provided most of the conversation, and the kids offered one-word answers whenever a question was directed at them, with the exception of Lainey, who offered a running commentary of every thought that went through her head. Dinner was not a long affair. No one had an appetite. Finally, Mr. Jeet leaned over and whispered conspiratorially to Lainey. When she nodded, Mr. Jeet called for everyone's attention. We have a special treat for you, Mr. Jeet announced. Please gather around. Lainey sought out Paganini from under the fronds of a potted palm tree. The jaunty bow tie she had tied around his neck earlier had vanished. Lainey lured Paganini out with a few carrot pieces and then led him to the center of the living room. And now, grand presenting the famous Paganini. She gestured to Paganini, who was grooming his ears. The puzzled audience looked at Paganini, unsure why they were doing so. We will now demonstrate Paganini's smartness, Lainey announced. A Oliver choked on the water he was drinking and Uncle Arthur pounded on his back. Lainey walked over to the other side of the room and then said, Paganini, come. Paganini hopped over to Lainey and sat up on his hind legs. The audience clapped and nodded in appreciation, impressed that Paganini was not hard of hearing, as previously believed. 
Good boy, Paganini, Lainey exclaimed, giving him a carrot. I knew there was something funny going on with that bunny, Aunt Auntie Harrigan commented under her breath to Uncle Arthur. When the applause glided down, Lainey began again. And now, another trick. She walked ten feet away from Mr. Jeet, and Paganini followed her. Mr. Jeet held an embroidery hoop one inch off the floor. Paganini, hoop, Mr. Jeet called out. Paganini zigzagged back over to Mr. Jeet and executed a clean jump through the hoop. Mama's jaw dropped. A slow grin came over Papa's face. Even Oliver was impressed. When the room quieted down, Lainey gave another command. Paganini lay down. Paganini flopped onto his side, an ear hanging over his eyes. The audience cheered. Last trick, said Lainey. Mr. Jeet leaned down and placed a toy piano on the floor in front of him. Paganini, play piano. Paganini scrambled up from his prone position and hopped to the piano. Then he placed his front paws on the keyboard and pressed down, creating a discordant chord. And for that moment, the Vanderbeeker kids forgot their troubles and joined the adults in loud applause and cheers. Mr. G and Lainey stood up together, held hands, and then took a deep bow. Encore! Encore! Papa shouted. Jessie took one of the flowers from the vase on the dining room table and tossed it at Lainey's feet. When Paganini tried to eat it, Mr. Jeep re reached down to rescue the flower and handed it to Lainey with a gallant nod. Lainey curtsied seven times before running to Mama and jumping in her arms. There was such a terrific noise following Paganini's show that at first no one noticed the persistent banging on the ceiling. Dull, dull thuds that came in short spurts before starting again. Mama leaned over to Papa. Do you hear that noise? Papa, who was congratulating Mr. Jeep, paused to listen. The, beginning, the banging began again. I think it's coming from upstairs. Isa's good mood after Lainey's bunny performance vanished. She glared at the ceiling as if she could beam lasers from her eyes and decimate the upstairs occupant. One by one, people began to glance upward. What's that banging, Papa? Lainey asked. I think it's Mr. Biederman, Miss Josie said apologetically. He does that sometimes when people come over. I think we get a little loud for him. Every single person in the room stared at her. Did you say Biederman? asked Mr. Van Hooten, a peculiar look on his face. He bangs on your ceiling? said Mama, shocked. Down with the Biederman, shouted Oliver, fist raised high above his head. Miss Josie lifted her hands helplessly as if apologizing. The room buzzed with indignation when banging resumed louder than ever. Isa shot out of her chair. She grabbed her violin from the console next to the front entrance, jerked the door open, and took the stairs two at a time up to the Biederman's apartment. Isa could vaguely hear her family rush out behind her, but it didn't stop her from pounding a fist on the door. It opened with a terrific bang as if the Biederman had been waiting for Isa to arrive. What? the Biederman roared. His eyes flashed and he loomed above Izza in his midnight black clothes. The wind howled around the brownstone. Izza, her usual tidy hair now an angry halo, pointed the tip of her violin bow one inch from the Biederman's cold heart. You, Izza spoke in a lar low, dangerous voice. You are a terrible, grouchy, horrible person. You are mean to Miss Josie and Mr. Jeet. You are making us move for no reason, and now you are ruining our last Christmas here. Isa pushed the hair off her shoulder and put her violin up, clenching her eyes shut and crashed her bow onto the strings. The piece was Les Furies, and Isa's playing was harsh and unrelenting. It was as if she were dueling against her own fury and disappointment and frustration and loneliness. Around her, the brownstone braced itself against the wind and against her, her rage. She played because the Biederman was cruel. She played because she had disappointed her parents and failed her siblings. She played because Benny hated her. She played because they had to move out of the home that they loved. She played because she was fighting with her sister and best friend, the person that she loved most in the world. She played because their mission had failed and now there was nothing else she could do. The music exploded through the brownstone, reverberating through the brick walls and making the air crackle. The brownstone shuddered and shook. Outside, the water wall was a frenzy of chimes knocking madly into each other and the sounds of crashing metal. When it seemed as if the walls themselves would start to crumble, the tension eased. Almost imperceptibly, Isis' vi violin gentled as if coaxing Le Furies into submission. Then quietly, 
So quietly, her bow glided along the first note of the swan. If Le Fury had cleansed her heart of her rage, the swan opened up space for Grace to enter again. The wind outside eased and the brownstone groaned with relief. Isis bowed slowed as she came to the end of the piece, suspended over the last ethereal high note. The sound continued to ring through the brownstone long after the bow had left the violin. When Isa opened her eyes, she forgot where she was. The beater man stood in front of her, his face so pale that his skin looked almost translucent. Isa took down her violin and found herself reaching out to touch his arm. The beater man stepped back and lifted his head to look at her with miserable, watery eyes. I'm sorry, the beater man rasped. He gazed at Isa in her violin for another long moment. Then he closed the door in her face. Chapter 21. Isa descended the staircase with heavy footsteps while her family and friends watched in silence. But the moment her feet touched the second floor landing, she found herself embraced from all sides by Hyacinth and Laney, by Oliver and Mr. Van Hooten, by her parents and Mr. Jeet and Miss Josie and Auntie Harrigan and Uncle Arthur. What happened? yelled Oliver impatiently, pulling at her arm. Are you scared, Isa? You saw him, right? He looked like a werewolf, right? I said, said, bouncing on the balls of her feet. Are you okay, honey? Asked Papa. He cupped Isa's chin in concern. That was the most excellent Les Furies I've ever heard, Mr. Van Hooten said, wiping tears from the corner of his eyes. I wish you would play like that in your lessons. Miss Josie ushered Isa inside the apartment while Mr. Jeep patted Isa's hand. The only person who didn't have a word to say or a hug to give was Jessie. In fact, she had disappeared. After looking around the living room, Isa wandered into the kitchen in search of her. A movement out of the open window caught her eye. Isa stuck her head out the window and then climbed onto the fire escape. Hi, Josie said. She was sitting on the first step. The wind and rain had stopped, but fat drops fell onto her head from a tree branch. Hi, Isa said, lifting her eyes to look up the water wall. Pieces of tubing were torn from the wall and two water wheels, and the wind chimes were missing. Damage from the storm, Jessie said, watching Isa survey the destruction. There was a long pause. You were awesome up there, Jessie, Jessie finally said. Isa didn't reply. Isa, please. Isa shook her head. I want to know why you did it. Jessie swallowed and then stared down at her scuffed sneakers. I never meant to hurt you. Honestly, I didn't think he wanted to go to the dance. And when I found out that you did want to go, I don't know, I felt like I was losing you. It scared me even more than moving. She finally looked up. Jesse, is a trailed off before stepping closer to her. You'll always be stuck with me. Jesse looked up, her eyes hopeful. I'm still upset, Isa informed her. I don't know if I've forgiven you yet. I'll make it up to you, Jesse promised. I'll cook Tuesday dinners for the next month. Isa contemplated. Then she shook her, head, shook her head and crossed her arms over her chest. I've been wronged, she said. I don't know if I'll ever recover. Okay, fine. I'll clean the bathroom when it's your turn. For how long? A month? Isa fixed her eyes on a point beyond Jessie's shoulder. Fine, three months. Isa finally cracked a tiny smile. Okay. Okay to what? Jessie asked. Okay to everything. Papa cleared his throat. Please, may I give a toast? When the room quieted, he lift his wine, lifted his wine glass. We have loved living here. I cannot imagine better neighbors, he nodded to Miss Josie and Mr. Jeet, better family than to Auntie Harrigan and Uncle Arthur, or a better teacher, and finally to Mr. Van Hooten. I've always believed that raising kids means more than just being a good parent and trying to do the right things. Papa went on, his voice beginning to wobble. It means surrounding your kids with amazing people who can bring science experiments and jam cookies, laughter and joy, and beautiful experiences into their life. From every part of my being, I want to thank you for giving me and my family the gifts of friendship and love. Miss Josie cried into a lace handkerchief, and Mr. Jeet hiccuped as tears pooled in his eyes. Mr. Van Hooten blew his nose on a dinner napkin, and Auntie Harrigan wiped her eyes with her sleeve. Uncle Arthur disguised his own tears by picking up Lainey and burying his head in her neck. Isa looked at her siblings. Operation Biederman had officially failed, but beneath the sadness, her heart felt too big for her body. We didn't win over the Biederman, Isa said, but this made me realize that a home is much more than a place. She smiled at her siblings. 
It's good to be a Vanderbeeker wherever we live. With his speeches done, Laney ran around distributing hugs and kisses, and soon everyone drifted back to the dining room, taking another helping of food now that appetites had returned. As people finished off their dinner and started in on dessert, Izzy cleared the table of dirty dishes and was on her way to the kitchen when Mr. Van Hooten pulled her aside. Izzy, I must tell you something about Mr. Biederman. What about the Biederman? asked Oliver, who was walking by with a piece of chocolate cake as big as the plate it was on. Are you talking about the Biederman? Jesse called from the kitchen. Don't talk about the Biederman without us, Hyacinth said, pulling Laney away from the dessert table, where she was sticking her fingers into the carrot cake frosting. Mr. Van Hooten took the stack of dishes out of Izzy's hand and set them on a side table. I didn't know, Mr. Van Hooten said, his voice lowering, that your landlord was Mr. Biederman. The kids held their breath. I knew him a long time ago, Mr. Van Hooten began. I didn't even remember that this was the building he lived in. He stopped abruptly. We know about his wife and daughter, Izzy said, about the car accident. What car accident? Jesse, Oliver, Hyacinth, and Laney said at the same time. Mrs. Castleman gave me a newspaper article about it. As I said, they died in a car accident. Mr. Van Hooten breathed a sigh of relief. So you know about that. But what you might not know is that his daughter, Luciana, was a violinist. She was my student. A violinist? The kids echoed. She was very talented. As you have always reminded me a little of Luciana, especially when you were younger. Creepy, breathed Jesse. The kids nodded in agreement. Well, I want you to know that the violin that you've been playing, you know it's been in my family for many generations, right? Well, I'd lent Luciana that violin too. But then when she died, Mr. Van Hooten paused. Well, her father didn't want anything around reminding him of his daughter, so he returned it. It's been sitting in my closet, shut away, until you came along. It's a lot out of breath that she didn't know she was holding. I thought you should know. Mr. Van Hooten's voice sounded as though it were coming from far away, as though he were talking at her from the other end of a long tunnel. The Biederman's daughter, Mr. Van Hooten's violin, is his violin, Luciana's violin. Luciana touched the same wood, feeling the same vibrations, hearing the same sounds. And just like that, the story clicked together. When the last of the guests had gone, and Miss Cheat and Miss... Miss Josie and Mr. G's apartment was returned to its original condition. Mama and Papa gathered the children and ushered them downstairs to get ready for bed. Isla changed into her pajamas before heading to the bathroom to brush her teeth. Oliver and Jesse were already there, and Oliver mumbled something with a mouthful of frothy toothpaste. What did you say? Isla asked. Oliver spit. I feel sorry for the Biederman, Oliver repeated. I never thought I would say this, but I feel sorry for him, too. Jessie said, rinsing her toothbrush under the faucet. I wish you could have seen his face when I went up there, Isa said as she squeezed the toothpaste onto her own toothbrush. When he opened the door, his face was all red from yelling and being mad, but when I finished playing the swan, his face had turned so white. I've never seen anyone look like that before, like he had seen a ghost. Oliver rinsed his mouth. He sort of did see a ghost, the ghost of Luciana. He shook his head. Jeez, that's so creepy. It's too weird that she played the violin with Mr. Hooten, too. Mr. Van Hooten, too, as I said, with the exact same violin. Do you know that violin has a different sound from other violins? The wood is so old that it makes this beautiful ringing sound. The Biederman must have recognized the violin. When Mr. Van Hooten said the Biederman didn't want anything that reminded him of his daughter, I felt this chill. Now I feel terrible going up there and playing the same violin his daughter did right in his face. Like I was throwing all these bad memories at him. Jessie put her arms around Izza and Oliver. You didn't know. Anyway, it's probably best that we're leaving so he can get some peace. I spent so much time avoiding him, and now all I want to do is make him feel better. Me too, Izza said. Me too, I go to Oliver. Not too much later, the twins were alone in their bedroom, snuggled under their thick comforters. I guess this is it, Izza said. The last Christmas Eve in the brownstone... The pipes that carried heat to the radiators banged relentlessly within the walls. Do you think we should do anything else for the Biederman, now that we know? Jessie trailed off. Isa looked over at her violin. I think that the only thing we can do now is give him what he's wanted all this time. Peace. I keep thinking about how he lost his whole family in one night. 
Jessie murmured from her burrow beneath the blankets. I can't stop thinking about it. Isa reached over to turn off the lamp next to her bed. Darkness took over the room. Me too. Good night, Isa. Good night, Jessie. Isa lay back on her bed, gazing at the familiar sights. There was a crack in the shape of the east of Eastern Europe on the ceiling. There was light that fell in from a long fell into a long rectangle on the floor beneath their between their beds from the street lamp right outside their window. There was the warm air from the radiator making the right side of her comfort her toasty and cozy. There was the whoosh of a car heading down the street. There was Jessie, her breathing becoming steady and deep as she drifted off to sleep. There were the rough grooves of the bricks lining the wall behind her headboard. There was the whistling of the pipes in the walls of the brownstone. There were the sounds of her parents' low murmuring as they climbed the stairs and quietly peeked into the kids' bedrooms. There was the sound of a distant car alarm and a dog's bark. This was home, and soon there would be goodbye. That's where we're going to stop for today. Tomorrow we will finish the story, picking right up with Wednesday, December 25th, and Chapter 22. We've been reading The Vander Beakers of 141st Street, written by Karina Young Glazer, published by Hot and Mifflin Harcourt. My name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you again soon.